is from file A56-7W. Classified top secret subject is Airwolf. A Mach 1 plus attack helicopter with the most advanced weapon system in the air today. It has been hidden somewhere in the western United States by its test pilot, Stringfellow Hawk. Hawk has promised to return Airwolf only if we can find his brother, Sinjin, an MIA in Vietnam. We suspect that Archangel, deputy director of the agency that built Airwolf, is secretly helping Hawk in return for Hawk's flying Airwolf on missions of national concern. Stringfellow Hawk is 34, a brilliant combat pilot and a reckler since his brother's disappearance. His only friend is Dominic Santini, whose air service is the cover for their government work. With Hawk and Santini flying as a team, its speeds rivaling the fastest jets, backed by unmatched firepower, Airwolf is too dangerous to be left in unenlightened hands. Finding it is your first priority. All right, welcome everybody to our new show, Full Throttle Television. Basically, we're going to be discussing all these great TV shows and eventually movies where they had a big focus on something cool like a, a high-speed helicopter, you know, a super motorcycle, basically any vehicle. And uh, that's going to be the run of our show. So I'm your host, Michael, and my co-creator, Ron. All right, so this is a kind of a show that we love when we were kids. I, I still enjoy it now. Shows that kind of focused around a vehicle. I mean, if it was just that, the show would kind of stink, but they always had cool characters mixed in with it. For the most part. There's a couple stinkers we're probably going to discuss. So you'll probably notice that the intro to Airwolf was a bit long there, so I, I apologize, but I really wanted that intro beyond the music where he describes what is going on in the show in case you've never heard of it or never seen it, which makes the question why you're listening to this, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ron, did you watch Airwolf when you were a kid? Oh, yeah. Religiously. Now, I kind of missed it when it initially ran. I didn't really catch much outside of reruns on USA. And then um, I think I only watched about a handful of them. And then later, I would grab the whole series. I've seen every episode, even all the way through the much maligned fourth season where everybody's killed off from the original series. And they just... Right, right. Yeah. But we'll start at the beginning. Um, what, do you, what are your memories of the show? Uh, well, my memory is kind of vague, but all I remember is that helicopter mainly had the best theme song, I think, than of any show that I've heard. And it's very repetitive, which blows my mind away that I like it so much. But <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's hard driving. A lot of the, the shows around that time had these theme songs that were like awesome. They're, almost like, they're almost like rock yeah. and roll, even though they're orchestra. Yes. Well, synthesizer. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Well, no, no. Some shows, some shows didn't use a synthesizer; they used a full orchestra. In fact, if I remember really? correctly, the first season of Airwolf they used an orchestra, and then it was the second season where they focused primarily on synthesizer. But you're right; the main theme has been always been keyboard. I love it. Um, so, it wouldn't be the '80s without it. So. No, no. That it's, it personifies. If they remade um, the show today, which they might, since Equalizer was such a big hit, I think they're going to start going after some of these grown-up shows from the '80s. Um, I think they're going to have to redo that in full orchestra. That I don't know. Maybe um, maybe some uh, a dubstep version of it. <laughs> awesome. Everything's good in dubstep, right? <laughs> well, it's at least amusing at least once. <laughs> Um, anyway. Yeah, so uh, for me, Airwolf, uh, it's one of those 80s shows that still stands the test of time for the most part. The one of the things that I think was frustrating with the show is the fact that the first season is very sophisticated, very focused on grown-up stories. Nothing was really black and white like the way it was with A-Team or Knight Rider, which were focused on um, like a family shows. This right. show was made for grown-ups. And, you know, they changed it in the second season because the ratings weren't as good as they wanted them to be because the show is very expensive. But, uh, you know, then they started adding the girl, which I have no problem with, but they started lightening the stories, and by the time they got to season three, it was a kid's show almost. So right. I, I can see why they canceled it. Plus, you know, Jan Michael Vincent had some serious alcohol problems. Even to this day, yeah. he it did some serious damage. But at that time, man, that first season, he was spot on. Definitely, definitely. Now, have you seen him lately, Jan Michael Vincent? Uh, I'm just looking him up now, actually, but I have not seen him lately. Yeah, he uh, got in a horrible car accident in 94, and I actually Ooh. saw a movie where uh, he had just come out of the hospital, but he was required by his contract to show up. His face is just absolutely beat up. Right. Yeah, and, um, and then he got a second car accident after that, and I guess he was just completely messed up. Uh, the alcohol took over. And he just lost his legs recently due to uh, diabetes associated with all his drinking. Yeah, maybe diabetes. I can't remember now. 
But you wow. know, I watch this now and I look at it, and he was absolutely in his prime. I mean, he had made some good movies before. Have you ever seen White Line Fever or The Mechanic? I've seen The Mechanic. Yeah, I mean, right then he was a hot star. He's in that Disney movie too, uh, The World's Greatest Athlete, I think. Maybe. Yeah, and he was like in a bunch of movies. Most of them were unsuccessful, but he was like one of those actors that had appeal. So I think, uh, you know, when they when it came time for him to go to TV, this was the right project because he had kind of like, you know, the whole thing about Stringfellow Hawk is the fact that he is kind of disconnected because a, the way he's lived, you know, the military life. And the simple fact that his brother is gone. Right. So I think he was the right casting for that. And, of course, they balance that out with Ernest Borgnine. The best. You know, one of the best. Yeah, I mean, he was a really <laughs> great character actor. He brought a lot of humanity and humor to the show because, um, you know, it being such a sophisticated, dark show, they needed some sort of light thing, or I don't think people would have connected to the show. Right, and they didn't go off the far other deep end with him either That's... no because he could have been hokey you know a lot of those shows back then the sidekicks right. were basically morons but he was he was probably more gifted at airplanes than uh Stringfellow was it's just he was a great pilot but man anybody who right. knew the guts of a plane it was his character well, it was like a he seemed like a mentor you know like he knew his stuff it, he's had his day and now it's Stringfellow's time but... right yeah right so did you re um before the show, did you watch any of the episodes, or did you watch the original movie? Uh, I watched the movie, the, the original uh, pilot. And, and I see, when I first got Netflix a few weeks, uh, months ago, I watched a few of the episodes in, but I can't recall them. <laughs> yeah, the nice part is, Airwolf at the time was not that popular. I think, at best, wow. it scored around place 30 out of 75. Wow. But the people who liked it were really loyal to it, so they had a consistent audience. Right. But I've just, I've been reading lately that the, you know, a lot of the shows from the '80s are are dated and they're starting to age pretty <clears> badly or they're just forgotten. But Airwolf is building an audience. So it, really, right, right now, yeah, the the next generation now is discovering the show and it's carrying on. So if there were to be a remake TV show or movie, I think it'd be successful. With only twenty four episodes. <laughs> no, 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 no. The show was on for four years. Four years. Yeah. First season was 13 episodes. It was a mid-season replacement. And then the second and third season are full 24 episodes. And then... Um, oh. Then it sorry. Went, yeah. Then it went over to USA for one season. And that was also 24 episodes. I think in total there's about 70 episodes. I could be a little bit off on that one. My Do your homework, stinks. wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at it on IMDb now. I missed the other listing there. Okay. Yeah, so you can find the whole series on Hulu. You can find it on Netflix. In fact, I think there's a handful of episodes up on YouTube if you don't have one of those membership services. But to get the complete series on Netflix for like seven ninety nine a month is amazing because there was a time, I don't know if you remember this, 15 years ago or so, I was buying uh, the cassettes from Columbia House where it was two episodes per cassette and it was $20 a month. Yeah. I only made it about six episodes in before I realized I'm going broke. Times are a change it. Yeah, well, I mean, media now is so much easier to get. Back then, it was just yes. like, well, we can only fit two episodes per tape, so let's just charge it like a movie. I was like, no. <laughs> but I just rewatched. Moving the, on. Yeah, I just rewatched the movie again, and you can kind of see that uh, the budget is still kind of tight for a movie and there's a couple sequences where you're like whoa did they just use like the worst stock footage of all time yeah was it the navy there was a section in there where they were taking on the uh, uh what was that cruiser or something right. like that battleship or something like that and it was stock footage of the navy guys jumping in there it was so out of place oh yeah because it was all washed was... out and grainy you could literally see yeah. the lines you know why did they just pony up I mean, they didn't have a movie. Universal Studios has a huge catalog. They didn't have a movie made within the last 10 years that had some sort of footage that had been useful. Right. Uh, that was, well, that was... it was just... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's all right. Go ahead. I would say it was just a short section anyway. They could have easily put that on a set. Yeah, it was just it's bizarre been... that they even did it that way, which makes it look cheap. That's the one thing that takes me out of it is those couple sequences. Right. But overall, I mean, I won't hold that against them, but... No, no. But the funny thing is, um, there was an Airwolf game for the Nintendo. Did you ever play that? 
I did a couple times. That I never was, had a Nintendo on my own, though, so. Yeah, that was one seriously hard game. I didn't play it when I was on cartridge. I played it when I was in, like, an emulator. And I was right. like, what were they thinking? This is insane. It made Top Gun look like child's play, and that game was hard. Yes, it was. <laughs> but, yeah, um, the Airwolf, the the theme, the look, that, but that helicopter, that was everything. Just seeing that was bad. Beast. And I believe it's completely a model, right? Like, they added parts no. to a real helicopter? No, it's a real thing? Yeah, it's, well, I, I yeah, it's their own creation, but it, I think it's, I think Bell, I can't remember the name of that. It was a Bell something or other that made uh, an actual existing model, and they just added to it. But okay, that's what I, mean. I, don't black. Know, I don't know why I said model. That, that's it's moronic. But the funny thing is, every time I look at the helicopter, I always see a shark. So I was always thought it was weird that they called yes. it Airwolf when it looks like, you know, a great white coming at you. Here we go. It's a Bell 222. That's what they call it. Unofficially called the 222A, if that means anything to any of you uh what do you want, budding aviators out there? <laughs> do you think the helicopter still exists? That's, I mean, I think there was only ever one of them. Do you think it's somewhere it's still in storage, or do you think it's destroyed? Uh, I hope it's not destroyed, but I've not seen anything on it. Yeah, you know, that funny thing is that first movie, I don't really feel like it should have been two hours. There is plenty of story, but it's pretty slow, so I'm kind of surprised it made it, you know, you know, beyond the pilot movie because... It kind of drags. Once it kicks into the series, though, they have all these great guest stars, and it moves like lightning. And right. I think I think as a series, it's better. So if you watch the pilot movie, you kind of need to see it just to set up the the concept and the scenarios. But if you're bored, seriously, the ep the second episode when David Carradine shows up, oh, it it gets great. So the one thing that bothered me though is, of course, uh, season four. It's the one that's kind of been maligned because what happened. CBS canceled it because there's too many difficulties. They had already lost $12 million on this show Whoa. because, well, most TV shows are made like this. The network will agree to air the show, but they'll only put up a certain amount of cost. The rest of the cost is up to you, either by selling it to other countries in syndication or, you know, in some way, like now they sell it on DVD and Hulu and Voodoo. That's how they make up the cost. But back then... You only had one option, syndication, basically. And so Universal was losing like $100,000 out of... Uh, each episode cost $1.2 million. And they're losing and losing and losing every episode. But they didn't have enough They didn't have enough to get to syndication. The general rule was you needed enough to blanket five days worth, you know, Monday through Friday during the afternoons, like when kids got off school, and, and have that for like four months. Well, they didn't have enough episodes, so Universal decided to take it to USA, which was a brand new network at that time. Right. And they said, well, we can't afford the helicopter anymore. We can't afford the cast anymore. What are we going to do? Well, let's bring Sinjin, because, you know, the whole series is about Stringfellow trying to find his brother Sinjin. Right. By the way, Stringfellow and Sinjin, where do those names come from? <laughs> Those are the craziest names I've ever heard. Let's have say, you have you ever met anybody with the name Stringfellow or Sinjin? They were given they were giving call names from birth, maybe. Who knows? Maybe that was that, that's pretty wild. Um, so Sinjin, they bring him in and they kill off Jan Michael Vincent. They kill off Ernest Borgnine. I don't know why they didn't just have Ernest Borgnine's character retire and then maybe show up every once in a while. That would have been nice. Yeah, so they have his daughter come in. She owns the whole plane thing. They're still doing the same missions, but now they have no heli helicopter, so they have to reuse all the footage from the previous three episodes. And in fact, if you look at the cockpit of the Airwolf in Season 4, completely different. It's it's like the most generic pilot cockpit you can possibly find. Well, it's an upgrade. <laughs> yeah, it, it looked bad. It doesn't have that in-depth technology look. I mean, there was something very cool about seeing the inside of that when Ernest Borgnine right. and Jan Michael Vincent were flying that thing. So that, that, that for the most part, and plus the movie is just it's shot in Canada, so it reeks of back bacon. <laughs> you can see it's foggy, and it's all, oh, it's so Canadian. Everybody's like, good day. <laughs> I kid, I kid the Canadians. Please don't be upset with me. I don't want you to put another higher cost on the maple syrup, for God's sakes. This stuff's so expensive. <laughs> So I ran oh, it looks on. like... Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, after the show was canceled, modifications were removed from the helicopter, repainted, and used as an emergency, an air ambulance, and it crashed oh, in great. 1992. A new full-size replica was created for the short-lived, or in the short-lived helicopter headquarters museum in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Don't know what happened to it after that. So, uh, yeah, so all that's left is a replica. That sucks. Now, this show was created by Donald Belisario. He had done yes. a couple TV shows before. He's mostly known for launching Magnum P.I. Mm-hmm. And then here's the weird thing about Airwolf. Okay, so there's an episode of Magnum P.I. that inspired the TV show Tales of the Golden Monkey. Do you remember this show at all? No. It was like Indiana Jones with Stephen Collins from 7th Heaven. Yes. So he would go, remember. it was like in the Hawaiian Islands or something like that. I can't remember. It's been a while since I've seen it. But he's in the islands of like Fiji or whatever. And he's going all these adventures. And he's fighting the Nazis. So that was inspired by Magnum P.I. But then somehow Tales of the Golden Monkey inspired Airwolf. And the whole concept was reworked and eventually became what we're, you know, what we watched recently. So it's weird, huh? <laughs> And the cool Always part is, intertwined. for the most part, Donald Belisario was always going from show to show to show. He never really had any, like, massive failures. <laughs> so after Airwolf got canceled, he went on to do Quantum Leap. Yes. Of one course, of the that's, best. That's one Ever. of our favorites. We should do a time travel show. Does that yes. count as a high-speed vehicle? <laughs> <laughs> sure. We'll, we'll make a special. We'll, we'll do, like, Voyagers and Quantum Leap and maybe Sliders or something. Um, was it considered high speed if it took him forever to get back home? Yeah. <laughs> I got the... Anyway. Right, and then, of course, after Quantum Leap ended, he did Jag, which was on forever and ever. Yes. Which, is, which um, spun off C um, NCIS. I'll tell you what, there's nothing he's done that I've seen that I don't like. Yeah. And so, you know, NCIS has a spinoff. So now there's NCIS New Orleans with Scott Bakula. Yes. Donald Belisario takes care of his people. That's right. <laughs> I have not seen an episode of that yet, but I've been meaning to. It's no, dog-eared. Uh, go on Voodoo. I think they have the first episode for free you can watch. You know what's funny? Is every episode we do together, we always talk about Netflix and Voodoo and Hulu. They should just pay us. <laughs> just go ahead and pay us That's now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think I'm pretty much wrapped up about Airwolf. Do you have anything else you want to say? No. Just if you haven't seen it do it yeah seriously it's one of the very probably about a handful of the dramas from the 80s that really hold up yes though i would still ignore that fourth season unless you just are a, a die hard fan <laughs> tell you what though if you're not a night owl don't watch it at night it is it is a drama <laughs> even though it's got a lot of action in it i end up falling asleep now and again so <laughs> make sure you're awake all right so our next show is going to be blue thunder i'm going to go ahead and play the intro for you So that's Blue Thunder, uh, based on the movie from 1982. And you just watched the movie, right? Ron. 
Okay, so you just watched the Blue Thunder movie, correct? Uh, actually, I did watch the series. Looking at my stuff here, I actually did see the series. Okay, so um, I had a now we've both seen the movie. I think we watched the movie for the first time when we we're like what fifteen or something like that. I don't That's know if it's cool. based on your recommendation. Had you seen it as a kid? Uh, probably. Yeah, I, I think remember, so. I started becoming a big fan of Roy Scheider, and we're at the video store one day, and you picked this up. You're like, "This is pretty cool." And I was like, "All right, let's yes. watch that." And um, I was truly fascinated by it. This is when John Badham was at his peak. He had just come off of War Games and had done Saturday Night Fever before that, and then he did Blue Thunder, and that's when he started moving to the action genre. After that, he'd do Stakeout, Nick of Time, stuff like that, Bird on a Wire, and all his movies, nice. uh, you know, uh, more comedy oriented. But Stakeout is a pretty serious, or not sorry, Stakeout, sorry, Blue Thunder is a pretty serious action movie, and it was like full on like focused on the technology, and it was a pretty decent hit. So I'm kind of surprised they didn't go to sequel. That they went to its series. I'm kind of glad they did. It gave me something to watch over and over. Yeah. Um, I mean, Helicopter wasn't as cool as Airwolf, but no. I loved it. Well, uh, they've said that Blue Thunder inspired Airwolf, which is kind of funny considering the shows premiered within a couple weeks of each other. Obviously, Airwolf being much more successful. Blue Thunder yeah. only lasted 13 episodes. There's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's a uh, little more cheesy. <laughs> yeah, here's the thing I don't understand about the TV show. Is it a reboot? I mean, it, it, it feels like it, the previous movie exists, but that can't be because the helicopter is destroyed and Jaffo is dead, right? Uh, I have not seen the movie in so long that I can't remember how it went. So. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Daniel Stern's character dies, and at the end of the movie, the helicopter is destroyed. Right. And so all of a sudden, you, you watch the, the pilot of the show, and it's... A lot of the elements from the movie being redone, like showing the helicopter again and all the action it can do, but it basically tells you that all their relationships exist and that there was a helicopter before it. It's very confusing. Here it is. Murphy lands on a train track to destroy Blue Thunder. That's what I thought. It don't, doesn't show him dying, but he, he destroys it. No, Murphy okay. is uh, Roy Scheider's character. He lives. Joffo, oh, Daniel sorry. Stern's character dies. Right, right. My bad. And uh, the TV show, the problem with the TV show is, beyond the helicopter being cool, there's not a lot going on with the characters. The first episode's pretty strong, but I have a huge problem with the additional characters of Bubba Smith and Dick Buckets. I... The most unfortunate name in all of acting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I have to agree with you on that one. Huh? Um, but there's no need for them to even be there. And it doesn't make any sense how two ex-football players who used to go up against each other are now police officers who are <laughs> roughly 50. <laughs> they just became police officers now. And they're very cheesy. I said they had Dana Carvey. What what other comedy relief did they need? Seriously. I know. And he, they had an actual comedian. <laughs> yeah, he kind of goes overboard a little bit with the voices. Like, he's still in Jimmy Stewart in the beginning. Yeah. You can kind yeah. of see, though, the beginnings of all of his work on Saturday Night Live in that role. Kind of a plug for himself, I guess. But <laughs> Yeah, I don't know anyway. if he was doing stand-up already at the time and doing those characters, or, you know, it was just decided <laughs> on the set. Hey, I'm pretty good at this. Yeah. Uh, um, actually, you're better at it than I am. But... <laughs> yeah, so the show didn't last very long. Uh, Columbia Pictures did put it out on DVD. But I believe it's out of print now, so if you feel like checking out an episode, it's on YouTube. <laughs> uh, I didn't say that out loud. But no, I, mean, I still think you should be able to check out the first episode of any TV show for free without feeling guilty. And if you like it, go buy the series. Exactly. There's not a whole lot to talk about with Blue Thunder, is there? No. We mm. kind of said it all already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the show lasted 13 episodes for a reason. It's a, a decent watch. I remember buying it bootleg off of some site like 10 years ago just so I could see it. Uh, right. This is before YouTube, of course. And being like, oh, this is nothing like Airwolf. Bah. I say if you're a big fan of Dana Carvey and just want to see what he used to do, watch it for that. Yeah. <laughs> That's about it. All right, so our third show is actually a personal favorite, which took us years to find. I'm going to get yeah. you because we got confused on what show it was based on the description. Mm -hmm. All right, so here is the opening to Auto Man. Doing what he likes best, fighting crime in the streets. You see, Walter's a policeman. 
Unfortunately, the chief doesn't want Walter on the streets. Captain, get back to your cage, boy. Now! So Walter must fight crime in his own way, in the computer room. That's where he's an expert. Fortunately for me, Walter's advanced knowledge of electronics led him to experiment with what is called a hologram. That's a very fancy word for a three-dimensional picture that, when perfected, can be made to look real, sound real. As a matter of fact, given enough power, it can even be made to feel real. That's kind of what got me into this world. My name is Otto Ann. You must be Walter Nemeke. How did you know that? It's on the programming you fed into my system. I must say, Walter, you're very good. Very good indeed. I look wonderful. If you do say so yourself. You programmed me to be honest. But tell me, why did you call me Auto Man? It means that you're the world's first truly automatic man. You can do anything because you're not real. Oh, but I am. I'm as real as you are. Just different. And thanks to you, perfect. Nobody's perfect, Auto Man. Well, that's not true, Walter. You've programmed me to observe other people and do whatever they can do as well as they can do it. Jimmy Connors playing tennis, John Travolta dancing. In fact, on a scale of one to ten, think of me as an eleven. I just created a monster. No, what Walter really created was a wonderful force for good. Follow man. Now that's a very unusual opening because for the most part, there's no music. It's the description of the show, which is a genius idea. Yes. You know, for someone to understand the concept and they boil it down into like a minute and a half, how awesome is that? <laughs> now they do play the theme song throughout the show and in the end credits, which I'll do at the end of the show here, which is still really great music. Um, so I remember you asking me about this show about, what, 15 years ago? And I thought it was a completely different show called Hard Time on Planet Earth. Right. I couldn't get anybody to remember the show for whatever reason. Yeah, I had never seen this show. And then one morning, I'm sitting there watching TV on sci-fi. I used to run these marathons of 80s TV shows or, you know, stuff like that. Like a six-episode run. And I'm sitting there watching it going, this sure sounds like that. This Holy crap, this is it, isn't it? So I started recording it. And you still have that tape to this day. I do. That's what you told me. You still have that VHS with the Autobahn episodes on it. I do, yes. Okay. Whether it works or not <laughs> is beyond me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whether I have a VCR that works or not, that's... Anyway. Yeah, so the... I had not seen this show until much later, almost like 15 years or 20 years after it originally aired. And I would say this was a very short-lived show, but it is amazing. 13 episodes yes. of pure, great family enjoyment, but it does not play down. It's very smart, very sophisticated, but at the same time, it's not above the heads of anybody that's like under the age of ten. Yes. And what also, I loved about it, watching it, is like it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't play down. It, a lot of these shows with technical whatever's in the back, it, they make up terms. They just pull out some buzzwords here and there, and you know, no, no one's going to know any different. But it seems like they did a little bit more research in some of the things, even though it's wildly out there, but still. Yeah. I mean, it's a they concept that's it. pretty far-fetched. But, yeah, it's like, in order to believe anything far-fetched, you have to have some sort of world you created so that you can understand what's going on. Yes. Now, of course, this is early in technology. A lot of people listening to the intro are like, yeah, of course I know what a hologram is. But 30 years ago, this was a new concept. All this computer stuff was just, like, fresh. I'm going to call home on my phone modem. I love that part. <laughs> what kills me is, back in the 70s and 80s, they didn't really have, like, proper computer boards and stuff like that so there's lots and lots of sets filled with blinking lights just random blinking lights board after board and no one ever knew what they did they just blink it's recycled from old star trek episodes yeah well do you remember that joke in uh airplane 2 when william shatner is in his space station and he's like i'm <laughs> surrounded by blinking lights i don't know what they do yeah <laughs> um so the cool thing about Auto Man is the special effects even today work. I mean, they just work amazing because they didn't focus on using uh, very early CGI like the way Tron did. 
they found a way of using reflective tape and animation to make everything work. And it worked great. Yeah, I mean, I just watched it recently. I was like, how did they make this? How do they make it look so good even to this day? I, I still don't understand. I read the explanation on how they do it, and I'm still like, nope, I got nothing. I don't understand. <laughs> I would love to be able to make a whole movie using these techniques. That would have been awesome. Yeah, and um, Desi Arnaz Jr., this is his only series, I believe. I don't think mm -hmm. he did anything else after this. Of course, he was in his mom's show as a kid, but he's really good in this, and so is, uh, what is his name, Chuck? Oh, darn, I should have looked. Wagner. Chuck Wagner. The thing that he does with his character is, I bet you 90% of the people who came in to read for Auto Man read him as strictly like a robot, like C-3PO. Mm -hmm. Then someone probably who didn't do that played it up too much, like made him too right. like ignorant or cheesy. Or Chuck Wagner, who was a Broadway actor at the time, who really did nothing in TV or movies, comes in and just makes him so innocent and so human and that's why you love the character. Right. And it's, it's, a, it's a shame that he didn't really, neither one of them really did anything after this, which is so strange. That's a, yeah, I was been trying to look up things he's done, and it's, it's like he disappeared after this. Yeah, but he did. <laughs> I mean, for he, mainstream. Yeah, he did one cheesy, like, movie for canon pictures, like some post-apocalyptic movie, and that was about it. Um, but he did finance a documentary on Auto Man, which you can watch entirely on YouTube. The TV shows are not on DVD. No one's airing them. So they're up on VO.com, V-E-O-H, the complete series. And whoever transferred them over to VO, they look amazing. There's like yes. no damage. It doesn't look like it came off an old VHS. Whatever they're doing, they did right. And this is a show that should be on DVD for uh, people to enjoy, just even from the simple fact of the special effects, like just so people see and go, "How did they do that?" Exactly. But it's it's, it's fun, family entertainment, like we're saying. It's entertaining for all ages without being insulting. Um, yeah, there's really I don't know what else I can say about it. Though the funny thing is, um, I was reading about the show. The special effects look so much like Tron, even though they're done completely different. That right. Glenn Larson, the creator of Knight Rider, Battlestar Galactica, and Buck Rogers, he got nervous that they would sue him, so he right. hired the special effects guys for the show. <laughs> and I guess it was part of their contract that they could never sue him based on the fact that they worked on this, because they'd basically be suing themselves. Right. That's a pretty, That's pretty smart thinking. <laughs> and, and the sad part is, Glenn Larson, this is pretty much the end of his run. Um... After Knight Rider, he really didn't have another successful show. Auto Man bombed, Manimal bombed. Uh, he Manimal. Did, do you remember Manimal? <laughs> Vaguely. <laughs> uh, Highway Man bombed. Do you remember that one? We should talk about that one, where it's like every vehicle you could ever think of was in one show. Kind of like Auto <laughs> Man. Kind of show. Funny? Okay, so originally we were going to talk about Auto Man because it had a helicopter in it. We're trying to do three helicopter shows. Now you, we both saw it in the intro, but they don't show in the first movie. But man, that plane that he has, or whatever you want to call it, some sort of jet. Yeah, that was awesome. I'm guessing they called it an auto jet because the other vehicles were the auto car. <laughs> right. But... Oh, it was. I get this. The auto chopper was also a Bell Jet Ranger, huh. which was what Airwolf was. Nice. Or similar. Similar, yeah, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, pretty much any vehicle you could think of, Auto Man could become. And he always had that little, uh, what's that little thing that he had, that asterisk flying around the sky with him? Cursor. Cursor, thank you. I think I think uh, asterisk is from Tron. That was Cursor the... apparently was a little bit of a ladies' man. Yeah, he was awesome. I love that character. <laughs> Even though he didn't really have uh, anything to say because he was like a computer bit or what do you want to call it. But he had yep. so much energy and fun. I loved watching that character. <laughs> It's just, I, seriously, I can't talk about the show enough. I love it so much. I'm so glad you told me about it and that we actually found the right show. Yes, yes. I am so, so grateful to you for finding it because <laughs> that was driving me nuts. Yeah, because so, yeah, I remember I taped Hard Time on Planet Earth and I showed you and you go, no, that's no. not it. <laughs> it wasn't bad, but that was not it. <laughs> all right. So I, like, all I, got, I think all he had to go on was, okay, there's this guy that has... Like he's computer generated and he could take 90 degree turns like it was nothing at high speeds. And that's all I gave him. No, and you also said he <laughs> had like a little thing, a little creature yeah. uh, flying around with him. And uh, Hard Time on Planet Earth, if anybody has never heard of it, it lasts about as long. 
And it was about uh, an alien who was a vicious warrior, and his superior decides that he needs to learn some kindness and humanity. So he basically sends him to prison, which is Earth, and he has to learn how to be a good person. And he's given, like, this little CGI, I mean, special effects CGI, it's not a real C, you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> this little robot talking thing that tells him how to function on Earth, like how everything works. It's a pretty cool show, too, but nowhere nearly as good as Auto Man. Uh, I was like... Now that you describe it, I, yeah, I remember that more now. Yeah, it's from the creators of Predator, oddly enough. What am I reading here? I was trying to figure out what the car was. And they, for those who are listening to this because they're into vehicles, which you should be, <laughs> uh, the car was a Lamborghini Countach LP400 from the mid-70s. No kidding. Beautiful car. Anyway. Now, he had a motorcycle too, right? Uh, that I don't recall. Um, I feel like every vehicle showed up, because uh, in the pilot episode, you see the jet, you see the car, yes. and I could swear you see, like, two other vehicles. It says, uh, features a futuristic airplane and a motorcycle. And a guitar and handgun, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, awesome. a, you know, the coolest special effect that they always had was the fact that Auto Man is technically a, um, a, a hologram, but he had, like, hard features, like, he could be almost real. Like he was mm-hmm. describing, but he could cover Desi Arnaz to protect him. Like someone starts opening fire on him, he could protect him like a suit of armor, and he could talk through him. So like the Auto Man's mouth was moving, but then you'd hear Desi Arnaz's yeah. voice, <laughs> which was a little disconcerting. Sometimes. Yeah, it was. It's weird. Really cool. <laughs> and I tell you, Chuck, he played that up really well. I think so. Yeah, but it's, a, it's a fearless performance. It has. It takes someone who really just. <laughs> absorbs that character becomes that character no matter what and you know it doesn't flinch because it won't look cool right <laughs> well i think it, uh, let's see he's over how do you want to say this you're not playing a robot but he's playing he's got all those quick movements every now and again like one would you know what i mean right okay so you know what's funny? That? you've seen starman correct jeff bridges yes yes i feel like those performances are really in line with each other. Except uh, Jeff Bridges plays a little more alien, but you can kind of see similarities in their performance because they don't play it as if they're uh, robots or they're completely disconnected. There's a human quality, but at the same time, there's so much, like, he's one of us but not one of us kind of feel. Right. Who was the first? Uh, Ted Ted Knight? Is that who played uh, Starman in the... Uh... TV series, or was it? Oh, no, Ted Knight. Isn't Ted Knight the the bartender on Love Boat? <laughs> Am I wrong? I think you're wrong. It's the guy who started an airplane, Robert Hayes. Robert Hayes. Wow, why the heck did I get Ted Knight? I don't know. Starman's a really great show, too. Man, there's so many great shows in the 80s that are just kind of, like, floating in the ether, and I just, no one's really talking about it anymore. He's in the car. He's Starman. He's the comic book character. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're talking the DC Comics character. Sorry. Well, my head is all screwed up right now. I'm so sorry. It's okay. <clears throat> my bad. But, yeah, that's – Hayes, he played a pretty good job uh, – played it pretty well, too, I think. Yeah, he did. Uh, anyway. Sorry. Not I digress. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so is there anything else you want to say about Auto Man? Uh, the powers that be. Put it on DVD. <laughs> You know what? That's just how we end every episode. We'll find a show yes. to say, The Powers That Be, release it on DVD. <laughs> yes. Make a like a high, make a hiney ho. <laughs> Rub the genie. Anyway, okay. <laughs> all right, so I guess we're signing off. Yep. Uh, so we're going to have more episodes, all kind of centered around one theme. Uh, I think we're talking about the next episode being about like good old boy kind of shows like Dukes of Hazzard, BJ and the Bear, stuff like that. Mm. If anybody yeah. has any suggestions... Uh, let us know on retrorocketentertainment.weebly.com. We're on Facebook under the same name, Retro Rocket Entertainment. And uh, we have all our shows up there on Libsyn and our website. So just check us out. Let us know how we're doing. And awesome. we're saying goodbye. Goodbye. Okay, here's the final theme song to Auto Man. Yes. Hartman, the one, good morning. <laughs> it's still the, the credits. Year, oh my god. Oh, scratch that. Hold on, people. There we go.